Good morning, everybody. How are you all today? Are you great? Did you sleep well last night? So, which means you did not cry. Last night, after my message, Brother Neville and I, we had a little discussion. Just not a long discussion, just a short 30-second discussion. <laughs> you ask the people to pray. Can this judgment be stopped? That was the discussion. And the answer is what he preached this morning. The good news, that's the good news that he brought to you this morning. The good news is it cannot be averted. It cannot be prevented. And the bad news is this. It has been decreed. So the good news and that's the bad news. Sorry about that. But the scriptures say, you know, God always makes a way of escape. Amen. Isn't it? That's how what a good God is. And our dear brother very beautifully preached this morning about the greatness of God's love that will take us through all this. Amen. So last night, I went to my room with a heavy heart. It is never, never easy to share a word from the throne of God, especially when it is dealing with something of that kind of a subject. Never easy, no? Please don't ever think. Prophets are so hard-hearted people that they are emotionless. The contrary is true. They are really broken-hearted people, you know. You do not know their lives behind the scene. How much they stand in the gap and cry before God. Up on the stage, they may seem like champions, you know. Delivering this, saying that I was there, I was here. All that seems very nice. But behind the scene, how much they stand before God and cry to Him, Lord. Is there any chance? Any chance? If this can be turned this way, or we can be turned that way, or what can be what can be done? You know, just like how Abraham interceded till the last moment. So I went with this question in my heart. Lord, it cannot be averted. Is there any other thing that can be done? So that was the question in my heart. So when I got up in the morning to pr pray and wait on the Lord, I remember that question. So I began to seek God. And early in the morning, when I was meditating the Word of God, and I read one scripture on my devotional, and Noah found grace in the eyes of God. That, that was a scripture, that was in my morning devotion now. Do you read the book, Our Daily Bread? Never. Oh, you poor saints. <laughs> oh, you have missed something wonderful in life. You know, it's a small little devotional, you know. I really enjoy it. I've been reading that for the past 20 years. Good little booklet with little thoughts for thinking, it stimulates your thinking, you know. So there was this scripture. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. As I was reading it, way and behold, the prophet Moses, his presence appeared before me. And then he told me, how did he found grace in the eyes of the Lord? Why did he find grace in the eyes of the Lord? What did he do? And 
what can the people do during this time of judgment? Then he opened my eyes to a whole understanding to several scriptures in the Holy Bible, several incidences and drawing up principles what we can do now in the things and the event that is right before us. So my sermon this morning is entitled Survival During the Judgment. It is coming. There's nothing you can do to avert it. All the prayers that we do are good. But it cannot stop it from coming. You know, when the prophet Jeremiah prophesied about the 70 years of Babylonian captivity, some Jews fought against it. He said, don't fight. It has been decreed. If they had not fought, they would not have lost their lives. They would still have been alive in captivity. But they fought against the will of God. They lost their lives. So we don't want to do that. Now, what did the Lord Jesus Christ himself say about what we should do during periods of judgment? The Lord Jesus Christ himself has spoken very specifically in Matthew chapter 24 and Luke 21 36 concerning what people should do during judgment. He said it's coming. If you read Matthew chapter 24, he prophesied about all the end time events that were going to come. And then he said, when you see the desolation of abomination, in Jerusalem, in the temple, he did not say, fight against it. However, he said, pray that your flight will not be in the winter. He gave them guidelines what they should do in the judgment. It is coming. When it's all around you, when you see armies all around Jerusalem, run to the mountains. He gave them the light. It is coming. You cannot stop it. And surely it came. So likewise, what can we do now? What should we do? We should prepare for the end times. Prepare to survive during the judgment. You know, in the 1950s in China, that rose up a wicked leader called Mao Zedong. And he introduced a policy called the Cultural Revolution, whereby he vowed that in 50 years, religion, any sort of religion, Christianity, Buddhism, whatever people in China practice, will totally be eradicated. There will be no God in the entire land of China. So everybody will be communist. Everybody will be one in equal. So during this cultural revolution, churches were bulldozed, pastors were arrested, martyred, massacred, all kinds of evil were being done. However, during those 50 years of persecution, the church grew in abundance. And you know Mao Zedong is dead and gone, but the church in China is still alive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. The church is still alive. Yeah. The man who vowed that he will destroy the church, destroy the very name of Jesus Christ from the very thought of every Chinese, He's dead and gone. But the church is going strong. So, several scholars of missions called missiologists were intrigued. What is the secret to the growth of the church 
or the survival of the church during this cultural revolution that it did not die. Instead of dying, it multiplied to hundreds and millions in numbers. So several of them, when all from the US went to China and they interviewed old pastors, old believers all over China, and they put all their findings together, and this is their conclusion. What is the secret for the church to grow? And every one of the old pastors told them, we prepared our people for persecution. That was their secret. We prepared the church for persecution. Because the church was ready, because the believers were ready, when the persecution came, it made us stronger and made us to grow and multiply rather than buckle down and die off. They were prepared. Today, with so much of escapist yeah. attitude in our mind, yeah. Lord, I want to be caught up in the rapture. Yeah. I want to escape. <coughs> that is the escapist mentality. <laughs> hey, you are not Houdinis, you know. You're not Houdinis, you know. Or David Copperfields. <laughs> you all are very holy Christians, you know. You do not know who Dini is. You do not know who God David Copperfield is. My, you are all holy Christians. <laughs> I am in the wrong company. <laughs> I must be very worldly, you know. You know who's Houdini, don't you? Okay, good. Now there you go. Now we are in good company. <coughs> we are not Houdini, so David Copperfield can just escape. You know, let me tell you one truth. When I started my ministry, I was part of all this Pentecostal tradition that teaches this escapist doctrine. The church will be raptured before the tribulation comes. She will never experience all this. I held to that belief. I preached that until I had an encounter with the Lord in 2006. <clears throat> On the first week of June 2006, I was preaching for a church in South India. And I was asking the Lord, what shall I speak at this convention? And the Lord Jesus Christ appeared before me and he said, have you read Matthew 24, 8? So I turned to the scripture and I read. It says, all these are but the beginning of sorrows. He said, you shall preach on this at this convention. I said, Lord, how can I just simply preach all these are beginning of sorrows? What are the beginning of sorrows? And then the Lord said, tell them that the church will go through the fires of tribulation. I said, I've never ever heard anything like this. <laughs> no, we are all going to be raptured, Lord. <laughs> you know what all charismatic and Pentecostal preachers prove about the rapture? That it will escape all these things? Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. They say when John was called by the Lord, come up! That is the rapture. <laughs> no. No. Then the Lord Jesus told me, no, you guys have got it all wrong. Yeah. Got it all wrong. And for the next two hours, the Lord sat with me, went through the whole book of Revelation, pointing scriptures after scriptures, comparing <clears throat> the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls, comparing one after another, and showing me the sequence of events 
He said, look at all this. I never ever said that the church will escape that tribulation, that mark of the beast that will be introduced and the church will still be there. That will be the final test of your loyalty. Your final test of loyalty to whom you will hold your allegiance to. When you cannot buy and sell. If you want to buy and sell, you must have the mark. So are you, are you going to compromise? It's easy to say no right now, you know. <laughs> when the rubber hits the road, then it's a whole ball of a different game. <laughs> you know? I've picked up a few American glitches. <laughs> so whole world of a different game, you know. It's easy to talk faith from here. It's very easy. In a cloistered environment. Very easy. But when the rubber hits the road, when you when you come face to face with making a decision that is a matter of life or death. <clears throat> what will you do? How will your faith stand? That is a test, you know. That will be a test. It's easy for you to say, oh, I will not take the mark. I will stand strong. What about your nursing baby? What about your nursing baby? that is crying for milk, what are you going to do? That is why the Lord Jesus said, in Matthew 24, better not to have nursing babies during the tribulation time. Woe unto those who have nursing babies. You are nursing your baby. You are breastfeeding. Okay, past that time. You need milk. What are you going to do? You need to go to the stores to buy milk. What are you going to do? Or your little kids crying for food. How long are you going to tell them, son, fast and pray? <laughs> How long? How long? So when that test comes, what are you going to do? Are you going to kneel down and say, Lord, even if I see my baby dying in my arms, I will not take the mark. Are you going to, do, are you going to say that? Can you say that? Yes. Again, I say, it's easy to say right now, you know. When you hear the shrieking cries of your babies, how could you make your heart like a stone? And then, shut your ears, say, I don't care how much my baby cries. I don't care. Let it cry and die. Glory to God. Like what we heard this morning, glorious death. That is the test, you know. The final test that the bride of Christ needs to go through, that fire. That final test. If we are not prepared for all that, we will fall. We will fall. In the hour of temptation, we will fall like what Peter did. So we must prepare to survive during this judgment. Let's look at the first example of Noah. You read about Noah in Genesis chapter 6 and 7. Of course, you read about him after that. But the main event in his life takes place in Genesis chapter 6 and chapter 7. Now, Noah received a prophetic word from God concerning a judgment that was going to come. He received that word. The first thing he did was 
he believed with all his heart and did not doubt that word of the Lord. You read about that in Genesis chapter 6 verse 13. And because of that, it was accounted for him for righteousness. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7, he believed with all his heart. Why did he believe it? How could he believe it? Because till that time, there has never been such a thing called rain. That word rain did not exist in their vocabulary. No one knew what it means to have waters coming from the sky and falling on their heads. Nobody knows that. That concept did not exist. So how is it possible for Noah to believe with all his heart that this was going to come or God really spoke to him? I was told this morning, Noah received his great-grandfather's mentor, Enoch's. Enoch's mentor came upon him. And like his great-grandfather who walked with God, Enoch too walked with God. And like his great-grandfather, was taught by angels, Noah too was taught by angels. The angels visited him and they elaborated him further concerning the revelations that were also given to Enoch about the flood that was going to come and will cover the whole earth. You can read about that in the book of Enoch. Enoch was shown the great flood that will come and cover the whole earth. Now these angels came and spoke to him. And early in his life, Noah began to seek God. He began to walk after God. Now, Enoch had a son called Methuselah, and Methuselah had a son called Lamech, and Lamech had a son called Noah. You don't find Methuselah and Lamak walking with God. Though Lamak was still alive, I mean, Enoch was still alive when Lamak was born. And he could play it on his grandfather's legs, hear, heard from his grandfather. Lamak was still quite old enough to know and hear and understand all the things that. Enoch was preaching. It is one thing to hear, it is another thing to practice. It's one thing to hear. You can hear and not listen. You can hear and not understand. You can hear and walk away not practicing it. That's what the other two great men did, but not Noah. He received that word, and because the mantle rested upon him, he walked with God like his great-grandfather. So how, that's the first thing, believing this prophetic word with all your heart and not doubting it. In Genesis 6, 8 tells us, Noah found grace in God's eyes. Because he believed God without any shadow of doubt. There was no shadow of doubt. No variable of turning around in his faith. He believed God implicitly. This is something we need to learn in our present day charismatic tradition. Believe God with all your heart like a little child without any doubt. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Yes. Nothing more, nothing less. And he acted upon the prophetic word by obeying to do what he was commanded to do. If you read Genesis chapter 6 verse 14 and verse 22, 
he immediately acted upon what he was told to do. He was told to build an ark. He went on obediently doing it without ever doubting. You know, if you read that scripture in Genesis chapter 6, it says there that Noah obeyed God in verse 22. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. You know, that phrase, according to all that God commanded him, you can find this phrase only other in the book of Exodus concerning Moses, that he was obedient to do all that God commanded him. Frequently, you'll find that phrase. And outside the life of Moses, you find it here. And Noah did according to all that God commanded him, without any doubt, doing implicitly, obediently, what you were told to do. It seemed like an impossible task. It seemed like an out of the world task. But he set out to do without doubting, without questioning. How will all the animals going to come into the ark? That's not your problem. You know, many times we end up worrying about the other part of the picture and we end up disobeying the first part of the puzzle. We need to take care of our own business and not worry about God's business. We are great champions, you know. We always sit down and worry about God's work, God's business. How is he going to do that? How is he going to do this? Why? Let him worry about his business and you do yours. It is God's problem to bring all the animals into the ark. We don't need to worry about that. No one need not worry about that. Noah's job was to build the ark. So your job is to build the house of the Lord. Your job is to build the tabernacle of David inside you. That's your job. When you do your job right, then the angel of the Lord will encamp all around you in the midst of all this flood, in the midst of the thunderstorm, in the midst of all hell breaking loose, the fountains of the deep broke loose, the ark was still safe. You will be safe. And Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He warned others whether they believe it or not. If you read in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 tells us, he was a preacher of righteousness. That's your job. You believe with your heart, you preach it to others. Yes. Judgment of God is coming to the U.S. Period. Whether people believe or they don't believe. Who knows if God gives them the faith to believe that word. Many times we shy away by holding back that word because we decide for others. Why? Let them decide. Your job is to be a carrier. You know, I always used to wonder about mailmen. Have you had mailmen coming to your homes? Now, no more in the age of emails, you know. But in the good old days, <laughs> when the mailman comes, I don't know about the US, but in India, you know, when, when they come, they'll say, post, and they'll throw the letter into the house, and they just walk away. <laughs> yeah, that's what they do. They just throw it. Post! Uh oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Yeah, like that. <laughs> and they walk away. I 
have observed this male men, you know. They never ever stop to think. Is anybody going to pick up a male? <laughs> they never. Or, like what they do in the US, you pick up the male, you throw into the dustbins. You see some males that are not profitable, you don't even open it. You throw it into the dustbin. All those fundraisers that come to you. <laughs> did, did I struck a chord? I'm sure you do that, right? The mailman does not bother whether you will open your mail or not. His job is to deliver, period. So it's your job. Just deliver. It is not your job to ponder or think in the remotest thought whether they will receive or not. That's not your problem. Your job is to deliver. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He preached all over the then known world. Warning people of the judgment that was going to come. His whole family of eight was safe, survived the judgment. Genesis chapter 7 verse 1. They survived. The judgment came. Though Noah was a preacher of righteousness, though he was praying, though he was a man in his generation was perfect in all his ways yet the judgment came it came however because he was prepared because he readied himself he and his household of eight members all survived they were protected from all the judgment. He was prepared for judgment because he believed God's word. Genesis, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7 tells us that. He believed. You can walk away from this conference thinking all these are just a bunch of balloonies. Or those who are watching online say no I don't believe America is a great nation who says it's not we didn't say it's not you heard all the three of us with tears in our eyes saying how much we loved America how much God loves America not only America the many nations of the world but at the same time the judgment is inevitable. It is going to come. So because Noah believed that word, he read it himself. He read it his family. And the whole family of eight members were protected. And they survived without a scratch on their skin during the judgment. The judgment came all over the world, but Noah's family survived. The other best part of the story is this. Their food and their water was given to them for 150 days. You know, it would have been impossible for them to store food, ration, water, not only for eight members, but look at all the animals. For 150 days. You know, at the end of the story, we know it lasted for 150 days. But prior to that, Noah did not know how long the flood was going to last. So how many tons of food could he have possibly stored up in the ark if not for the supernatural multiplication of food by God that were even brought to them by the angels of God. Just like the angels brought food to Elijah. 
Where did that cake and the water come from? Not once, but twice, you know. The angel brought him some honey raisin croissants. <laughs> or muffins. And a cruise, a bottle of water. Where did the angel get that from? They did not walk into any grocery shop to buy, you know. And look at John chapter 21. The Lord Jesus Christ made a fire and he put fishes and he barbecued fishes. Where did he get those fishes from? Right? When you walk in obedience, when you act in obedience, when you live in obedience, even though there be not, it will be there. It will be made there. All you have to do is walk in obedience without pondering about the results. When you walk in obedience unto God, it is God's duty to provide for you, to take care of you. You know, when I first came to the U.S. in 91, the Lord called me to fast for 40 days for the United States of America. My hosts, a wonderful American family in Cincinnati, Ohio, were going away on a missionary trip to the Europe. So they were going to be gone for two months. So they allowed a total stranger to stay in their house. They gave me the keys, the whole house. I could have just emptied everything, you know. <laughs> They trusted their life with me. Anyway, you know, Indians are great tea drinkers. And I, for once, drink at least 10 to 15 cups of tea every day. Those are the minimum. <laughs> the minimum. You know, so this family, they asked me, what do you need during your days of fast? I said, I don't need anything except some milk for my tea. They said, okay, we, we buy you two gallon milk. And uh, if you need more milk, you can call our daughter-in-law and she'll run by to the nearest uh, supermarket and pick you bottles of milk. I said, that's fine. Now, keep all this in mind, okay? 15 cups of tea every day. Two gallons of milk, how long will it last? Tell me, how many days? Three days? Okay. Now, please remember your math. Okay? <laughs> remember your math. Don't forget your math. <clears throat> you said 15 cups of tea a day, two gallons of milk will last at least about three days. No? Let's say average, okay? You, you all said that. No, I didn't say that. Okay. Six days? Okay, six days. Okay, I'll, I'll be very kind to you. Let's make it seven days. Okay. Seven days. Now, so, the missionary, the couple are gone. I'm all alone in the house. So I'm praying the whole day, and every now and then I come up, I make tea, I go back, and then when I come out in the evening, I hardly eat, just drink tea. I enjoy that, you know. So 15 cups, 20 cups a day. <laughs> so this went on, and went on, and went on, and went on. Lo and behold, the day came when the couple returned back home. So everything was okay. So this lady of the house, she went to the basement to check, to look at all the bottles of milk, empty bottles of milk, so that she can uh, get rid of all of them. And she went down to the basement. She never found any single bottle of milk. So she, kept, she thought that I had already got rid of all the bottles, you know. 
So she came and asked me, so where are all the bottles? I said, what bottles? I said, you have been drinking tea 15, 20 cups a day. How many bottles of milk did you consume? I said, hmm, good question. <laughs> you know, only then I realized the, the bottle of milk that she bought the first day before she left lasted me all throughout 40 days of my fast drinking 15 to 20 cups of milk every day. Only then I realized, my God, the, the level of the milk never went down until they stepped into the house. Then it went down, zero, finished. So, now, you tell me, if God can, in his great kindness, do that to me, a stranger in America, how much more will he do for you, the sons and daughters of this soil? When you believe God, when you walk in righteousness, he will do for you more than what he did for me. He will cause the food to multiply for you. You need not worry. Don't stock up your basements. Don't stock up your storerooms with all waters and food supplies. Don't. That is fear. Fear. Example number two. Look at Lot. You read about Lot in Genesis chapter 19. Now, what kind of a man is Lot? The Bible tells us he's a very kind-hearted man because he was hospitable to strangers. When two strangers came into the city, you know, Lot, who was seated by the gate of the city, entertained them. He was so hospitable to them. Genesis 19, verse 1 and 2 tells us like that. He was so kind, very hospitable to them. Hebrews 13.2 tells us, Do not be unaware to entertain strangers. Sometimes they may be angels in disguise. So in Lord's case, the stranger was an angel. And he was so kind. He was merciful. He was very, very hospitable. You know, if you read Matthew 25, Verses 35 to 40, the Lord Jesus said, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was naked and you clothed me. And the righteous asked the Lord, Lord, when did we do all that for you? When you have done unto the least of my brothers, you have done it unto me. So when you are kind and merciful to the less privileged people, you are doing it unto the Lord himself. But when you hold back because you think you need it, then you have been self-centered, you know. When you hold back, when you hoard up treasures for yourself, thinking that you need it for rainy days. You know, you heard it been said, your dollar is going to crash. When the dollar crashes, all the tons of money you have in your account are useless. All the hoarding up of your wealth for your own self, for rainy days, for emergencies, are useless. Because they all become zeros. What good is it? When you have, you could have given it away to the poor. When you have, you could have given it away to genuine works of God. You know, that's exactly what the widow of Zarephath did. She was out in the town picking up some sticks to cook one last meal, just two raisins or two muffins for her and her son, last meal of their lives. And the prophet Elijah comes into town and the Lord told him, look at that widow. 
that woman. Yes, she's the one. I have appointed her to take care of you. Elijah did not know that poor woman is going to die. So he went up to said, give me some food to eat. So she looked at him and he said, sir, I only have this one handful of flour. I'm going to bake two muffins, one for my son, one for me. That's the last meal we are going to eat, and then we are going to pray, and we are going to die. So he said, I don't care about all that. <laughs> if you want to die, you can die. But let me eat. <laughs> so that woman thought about that logic. Yeah, why not? If I eat this meal, I'm going to die. If I don't eat, I'm going to die. So why eat and then die when I can give this meal to this prophet of God? He needs to live. If he lived, he could bring the oracles of God for the entire nation. He brings the government of God. He is a spokesman of God. So he needs to survive more than I do. Look at the sacrificial attitude of that Zarephath widow. She was so sacrificial. She thought like that. She said, all right. She begged him the two muffins. He ate those two muffins, drank some water, and he blurted. And don't you blurb? <laughs> you people react as if the Indians are the only people in the world who blurb and they eat. Don't you? We all do. If you are a human, you blurb. So as he blurbed, he said, Woman, what do you have in your house? She said, what more is there in my house? <laughs> you cleaned up everything? <laughs> I only have empty vessels in my house. He said, go. Till the rain comes at my word. The tiny, weeny bits of flour in your, those vessels and the little drop of oil in the bottle will never run short of supply till I say it. And she said, hmm? <laughs> And she went back home. He was their guest. She made an upper room for him, you know, to stay. And they scooped up from the bowl Flower came, flower came, flower came, like, like the story of my milk. It never stopped supplied until three years later. Yeah. Look at that. Can you beat God? You can't. Before you can have this kind of miracle provision, you must have this attitude of giving. Sacrificial giving. Not thinking for your own self. We must learn to not be self-centered. Stop that. Stop that. The sooner you will learn to crucify your flesh, to crucify that self, the greater will be your victory to walk in glory. Die to self. Which is quite difficult because we love ourselves so much. Right? We love too much, if not three much. Why always stop at two? No, you can go to three or four. 
So Lot was a very, very kind-hearted man. Secondly, he was a righteous man. He did not approve the sins practiced in Sodom and Gomorrah. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 7 to 8 tells us like that. He looked, was so disgusted with the sins of the land that he always stayed out of the city at the gates, sorrowing, weeping, and interceding for his land. The third thing about him, you know, he's so sacrificial, he was even willing to give his virgin daughters to be raped mercilessly by those lustful fanatics in Sodom and Gomorrah to protect the two angels. He don't even know who these two men are. Till that moment he didn't even know they were angels. But he was willing to trade his daughters for total strangers. That was the pinnacle of his sacrificial kind-heartedness. You know, God counted all that now before he was saved. He counted all that, how he was so kind, how he was so merciful. It all adds up to your merits. You know, when you give to the poor, when you care to the poor, when you're kind and you're merciful to the poor, those acts of doing good to the poor, they are very, very great and precious in the eyes of God. When you give sacrificially, denying yourself. You know, this, that uh, family in Cincinnati that I told you earlier about, the husband, he worked as an accountant for Procter & Gamble. And uh, his wife was a housewife. And they were missionaries. They, had, they pastored a small house church. Every summer, they go to Europe on a mission trip. And in the winters, they come to India. So this was their lifestyle. They lived very simple, frugal lifestyle. And uh, when I looked at their house, you know, it's very simple. Unlike a, an average American family, very down to earth, barely any niceties in their house. And the carpet in their living room is, is torn apart like the carpets you find in poor countries. All the ends were coming loose apart, you know. So when I first walked into their house, I was very shocked and surprised that their living condition is like how? It is like in, in India. So one day, their second daughter-in-law, a very kind-hearted woman, told her mom, we want to bless you with this amount of dollars to buy a nice carpet for the living room. So many missionaries are coming and going. We want the house to look nice. So the mother-in-law was so happy to receive a kind gesture from her daughter-in-law. Now I was an eyewitness to all this. So that evening, they decided to go to their nice mall in their town to buy a nice carpet for the living room. So after the daughter-in-law left, it was lunchtime. So while we were lunching, the phone rang. So this woman walked up and picked up the phone. It was the missionary friend from Romania. So he, he just called just to say hello. And then this woman asked him, uh, by the way, you are making a orphanage, you know? Is it all completed, the building? He said, you know, everything is done except for the roof. So she asked him, how much would it cost? He said, $2,000. That was the amount the daughter-in-law gave to the mother for the carpet. So she said, all right, don't worry. We'll pray that God will provide. She hung down the phone. Her husband and I and she were lunching that afternoon. So she came and she sat down. She took the fox and the knife in her hand. And as she was cutting the lamb, she looked up at her husband and said, Honey, no, but 
People hardly come to our house. Do you think we really need a carpet? And her husband, you know, without lifting up his face from the plate, he said, Need you ask me? Send him the money. <laughs> so they wired the $2,000 to this missionary in Romania. So I thought to myself, my, these people are wonderfully sacrificial. Now, after this incident, they were gone in Europe. So I was 40 years fasting and praying. One day, I was caught up to heaven. And I was walking down a street. And I saw many, many houses. And I saw one particular house had unique architecture. And as I was looking, I heard a voice saying, look at this house. What do you think about it? And I turned around and I saw the Lord Jesus standing by my side. I said, Lord, I'm very mystified by the structure of how the house is made. And in, on earth, we don't make houses like this. We lay bricks, one on top of another, and then we cement it. But here, I found, instead of bricks, it was one precious stone put on top of another. The entire wall was made of different kinds of precious stones. A topaz, a barrel, an amethyst, a diamond, so many kinds. The Lord just said, come here. He said, look at this particular stone. It looked like a large ruby. He said, do you know what this represents? He said, no. This is the gift that they sent to Romania for the carpet. You know, remember the scripture says in Matthew 6, 19 and 20, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. How are you going to lay up treasures? By giving to the poor. When you give to the poor, when you deny yourself and you give to the ministries of God, that sacrifice is translated as a precious stone up in heaven charged on your account. It's charged on your account. When you give liberally, when you give generously, denying yourself. It's, you're not giving your leftovers, you know, that doesn't count. You, you give when it pains you. It causes you something. It causes a sacrifice. That's what we find Loth doing here. His two unmarried virgin daughters, he was willing to trade them to save two strangers. Fourthly, he believed with all his heart when the word was spoken to him that judgment was coming upon Sodom and Gomorrah. In Genesis 19, Verse 13 and 14. He did not doubt. Though he hoped that the judgment can be averted. You read in verse 16. He hoped it could be averted. But he did not doubt that the judgment was coming. Now I want to show you something very, very interesting. This was what was pointed out to me this morning. Please turn with me to Genesis 19. We look at the household of Loth. Now, we find that in verse 8, now I have two daughters who have not known any men. So he has two virgin daughters. You, are you putting all this down? Okay, keep all this in your math. Now look at verse 14. And Lord went out and spoke unto his sons-in-law. Now, sons-in-law means more than one. Everybody agrees? Son-in-law is one. Sons-in-law, at least two. So if they are sons-in-law, there must be daughters, uh, daughters, right? So that's another two. So two daughters. Two sons-in-laws, 
two unmarried daughters, Lot's wife, and Lot. How many? Eight. Eight. How many saved in Noah's time? Eight. Now we are going by the law of minimum. So eight, at least there were eight members in Lot's family. So the angel asked him, how many are there in your family? Because they have been instructed to save Lot and his household. So everyone in Lot's household, whatever the number may be, are, were appointed to be safe. So there were eight. So Lot goes and speaks with them, the sons-in-laws and the daughters refuse to believe that the judgment was coming. In Matthew 24, verse 40 and 41, the Lord Jesus said, two shall be in the field, one shall be taken, one shall be left behind. Eight members in the family, four chose not to believe, four remained. Four believed. Now out of the four, they were out from the city of destruction. Just as they were about to reach the mountain, the promised land, Lot's wife missed the boat. Matthew 24, 13 says, He that endures till the end, only such a person will be safe. You are out of judgment, but you must endure till the end to be safe. If anywhere along the line, though safe, you can yet be lost. One safe is never safe, you know. You can lose your salvation. You can be stripped of all the glory and the honor that God had vested upon you. You can be stripped of everything and be an ordinary person in the kingdom of God. That was the sad fate of John the Baptist. The person whom the Lord Jesus called to be the greatest of all prophets. Yet, the very next sentence he said, but he is no lesser than the least of the people in heaven. Why? Because he doubted the Messiah. He doubted. What a great punishment, you know. Because his eyes saw the sign that God gave him on whomsoever you see the Holy Spirit coming upon, he is that Messiah. And all his life, for 30 some years of his life, he was trained by the Lord in the wilderness to prepare the way for the Messiah to come. That was, that was his life's mission. That was his call. And when the Messiah came, he even pointed his finger and said, Behold the Lamb of God. He pointed his finger and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And then he saw the Holy Spirit coming like a dove. And yet he sent two of his disciples and to ask, Are you really the one? That one sentence stripped him of all his glory and honor that he had received. God. Saved, but ordinary. So, preparing for judgment, believing with all your heart that this is coming, believing with all your heart and preparing yourself like what Noah did. And then from Loth you learn, endure till the end. Never give up in between. You will be tempted to give up. The temptation will come to give up. How will the temptation come? That brings us to our point number three. You will be abandoned 
by the Lord. Abandoned. When you are abandoned, like forsaken, how is your faith going to hold up? Is it going to buckle down? Or are you going to stand tall, eight feet tall? How are you going to stand? When all hell breaks loose below you. It's, it's good. You know, you, you can stand strong in faith when all things go well for you. When all hell breaks loose, how will you react? What will you do? When it appears, the very God whom you trusted had forsaken you. What will you do? Let's look for a classic example in the lives of the three Hebrew boys mentioned in Daniel chapter 3. The judgment was passed. What is the judgment? All those who will not bow down to worship the idol that Nebuchadnezzar had made will be thrown into the fiery furnace. That's the judgment. It has been passed. What are you going to do now? Are you going to say, Lord, you know, I believe you. But you also know that my flesh is weak. So I'm going to bow down only my body, Lord, but not my heart. You know. Could it work like that? Lord, you know that I don't mean to take this mark. It's only in my hand, but not in my heart, Lord. You know. No, he doesn't know. He doesn't know. You're only fooling yourself, you know. If you think by saying, Lord, my heart is not doing it. Only my flesh is doing it. So don't look at my flesh. Look at my heart, Lord. It doesn't work. You only fool yourself. That's how we have been fooling ourselves all this while. We take this scripture out of context, no? The flesh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We take it out of context to camouflage ourselves or shield ourselves from continuing, for continuing in sin. We say, oh, you know, past, you know, I, I don't want to do that. But, you know, the Bible himself says, what to do? The spirit is willing. My spirit is willing to live the crucified life. But my flesh is so weak. It loves the lust. It loves this. So, you know God understands. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work. That is the false doctrine, the demonic doctrine of hyper grace, you know. Come out of that Babylon, people of God. Come out of that Babylon. Don't be sucked into that Babylonian teaching. All those are Babylonian teaching. Come out. Come out from Babylon. Because that false church, Babylon, is going to fall. It's going to fall. And you heard yesterday that God is raising up a new church. A new church built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ, his teachings itself being the chief cornerstone, a new church for the end times that will survive through any fire, pure, undefiled, uncorrupted from the church that is today. She is worse than the woman that writes on the beast found in Revelation chapter 17. She is worse than Jezebel. Worse than Hosea's wife Gomer. Worse because all these people did not know righteousness. They did not have Christ in them, the hope of glory. But the church possessed all this. Yet, she
she chooses to allow doctrines of demons to infiltrate into her. Yet she allows this false prophetess Jezebel to come in her midst and to teach false teachings, to seduce the ministers and the believers to commit fornication and to eat foods offered to demons. What are those foods offered to demons? Those are the false teachings and the doctrines that come from those demons. Taking away your eyes from the preaching of the cross. Taking away your eyes. Only the cross is the power. When you live the crucified life, that gives you the power to overcome. Overcome. If you don't want to live the crucified life, then there is no power. There's no power. Then you have holiness, but you deny the power of it. So that is a false holiness. A false godliness that you, you put around you. Like what the Pharisees did in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ. They wore long robes and held a very serene look on their faces. And the Lord Jesus Christ looked at them and said, You hypocrites! You are just whitewashed tombstones. He did not mince his words. He did not know what it means to be politically correct. He called a spade a spade. So these three Hebrew boys were under judgment. They were abandoned. You know, till the last moment they were hoping that God will somehow do a miracle and change the heart of the king so that they will be spared from throwing, being thrown into the furnace. They prayed and they prayed and they hoped and they hoped. But God did not answer their prayers. So they were bounded hand and foot. How will you like that for your faith to be tested when you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and God did not answer your prayer? You were bounded hand and foot. Before they were dragged to be thrown, the king, being so nice and kind, he said, I'll give you one last opportunity to repent. One last opportunity. If you will bow down and worship this idol, then you will not be thrown. So the boys look at the king and said, Oh great king, we honor you, we respect you. Our God is able to save us. Now that's not the best part of the story, no? The best part of the story is what they said next. Even if he does not save us, we will not bow down. Even if he doesn't save us, even if he doesn't answer our prayer, that doesn't matter. Our faith lies not in the providence. Our faith lies in the immovable rock of ages. Our faith lies in the God who is God. He's a good God. Whether he does good for me or not, he's still good. Whether he answers my prayer or not, he's still good. Whether he heals me or not, he's still good. He is a good God. Look at their remarkable faith. They were under judgment. Their faith in God, who does not forsake them, protected them. It is their faith that made them fireproof. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Yeah. Let me tell you one wonderful thing. If you read Exodus 27, I am living up to my reputation being a long-winded preacher. <laughs> I'm just halfway through. <laughs> Shall I stop and continue tomorrow? I must ask my boss. <laughs> we
we'll continue tomorrow okay you are the boss not halfway <laughs> three quarter way three quarter done are you sure everybody yes. okay uh, we'll go up to 130 is it okay all right you know each time i come to lancaster i always pray lord i, I should be good i should be good i should be good <laughs> i should not live up to my reputation I'm becoming like James Bond, you know. <laughs> His reputation precedes him. <laughs> so, if you read Exodus 27, verses 1 and 2, God gives Moses how to make the plans, how to make the altar of burnt sacrifice. He takes, he tells him, take a shitty mood and overlay it with solid brass and then make the brazen altar. Several years ago, some pastors took this scripture to the task. They made a door, three by six of shitty wood and overlaid it with brass and they brought it to the London City Council's Fire and Safety Department. They said, we would like you to test the fire worthiness of this door. They never told them what it's made of. And the fire safety officers subjected this door to all kinds of extreme heat. And their result was, it is 100% fireproof. And then they told them it is just shitty wood found in the Bible. Shitty wood covered with brass according to biblical specifications. You know the altar of burnt sacrifice, constant burnings are taking place there. You couldn't have, it should not be covered with shitty wood overlay with gold. The gold will melt. So God made it to be covered with brass in the same manner. The shitty wood is our flesh. Their faith in God became like a solid brush all around them. When they entered into the fire, they were 100% fireproof. Amen. Amen. In the same manner, when, you, when your faith is strong like that, whatever judgment comes, they may be burning up this entire town, but this church will be fireproof. Amen. You will be fireproof. Not a hair on your skin will be burned. That's what the scripture says, right? Not a hair was burned. God protected. Though you are abandoned, but in that abandonment, you see what is deep inside you. How strong is your faith? Whether it, does it still believe that God is a good God? I have walked through that, you know, for three years of my life, very recently. And that was a great test. During that test, the foundation, like what Neville shared this morning, the foundation was, the test was, do you still believe that God is a good God? In that abandonment. Do you still believe in the love of God? That God loves you? That his loving kindness endures forever for you? In spite of all the lies that come. Like a flood. In that abandonment. I felt that totally abandoned by God. In the dark night of my soul. Have you read the book called The Dark Night of the Soul? You should read it. By John the Cross. The Dark Night of the Soul. In the dark night of your soul. Where is your God? In the dark night of the situation surrounding the three Hebrew boys. 
they were under judgment they were judged and sentenced they said even if God does not help us even if we are fried chicken of Babylon <laughs> Babylon fried chicken you know <laughs> yet we will believe our God we will die singing that God is a good God you know when this revelation was given to me at the same time it was also given to me to understand this is how the martyrs face death singing because their faith now becomes they are fireproofed they are fireproofed nothing was scratching them nothing was scratching them and then I immediately I recalled the many stories I've read about martyrs who were burned at stakes none, none of them cried you know they were either singing or they were whistling or they were smiling how could you do that because you become fireproof now look at the Lord Jesus Christ judgment was passed on him to be the sin bearer that was the judgment upon him there was nothing he could do to avert that because that was a judgment that was upon him in Luke chapter 9 verse 30 to 31 you read that two witnesses Moses and Elijah were sent to even remind him or talk to him about the sufferings that he was going to go through they told him and then he prayed in Luke chapter 22 verse 42 he prayed Lord if it be possible let this judgment pass away see at the darkest night of your soul when your when your faith is tested to the extreme in our flesh we cry out Lord let this pass when will it be how long will it last if possible let it be averted if possible take it away remove it away don't let this judgment come the Lord himself prayed like that but then he submitted willingly to the judgment he said I know this cannot be averted because I came for that so he submitted himself 100% by embracing it he embraced it now look what happened on the cross Matthew 24 verse 46 tells us he cried out my father my father why have you forsaken me till that moment you know he always confessed I and my father are one I am the good shepherd the very word that God spoke in Exodus 316 I am that I am the Lord Jesus repeated himself many times by saying I am the way I am the good shepherd I am the door he said all those to tell the Jews that he is the God of his fathers in Exodus 13 316 he kept on saying that but now he felt totally abandoned totally abandoned why 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 yet even in that abandonment he did not lose his faith in God because in Luke 23 verse 46 we read he saying Lord into your hands I commit my spirit even though he felt abandoned he did not lose his faith he still trusted in God like the three Hebrew boys even if God did not help us we will still trust in God so that is the faith that we need that will see you through during this period of judgment the only way
for us to survive is hold on to your faith. All things that can be shaken will be shaken. So that the things that cannot be shaken will remain. What is the only thing that cannot be shaken? Your faith in the unchanging God. That is the only thing that remains. Everything else will fall apart. Your world will fall apart. Your mind will fall apart. But your faith in the unchanging God, it will not fall apart. Only that will remain till the end. So now let's conclude this. In conclusion, can the judgment be averted, stopped, or God's mind change? No. The Lord Jesus Christ himself told his disciples in Matthew 24, 15 and verse 20. He said, all this will come. But when it comes, this is what you shall do. He told them what to do during the judgment. He said, this is what you do. Pray that your flight will not be in the winter. Pray. Protect yourselves. Take care of yourselves. It's a survival of the fittest during the heat of the game. And in Luke 21, 36, he said, Pray always that you shall be accounted worthy to escape. If you don't pray, then you won't be accounted worthy. Pray always. Pray always. What does that mean? Built. Built. A healthy, disciplined relationship with God. A consistent relationship with God. Not a once a week relationship. A consistent daily walk with God. You need to build your faith. These are the days before the judgment is poured out. In days of goodness. Like what Joseph did now. In seven good years, store up the wheat. Store up. In during these good years that are before us, store your spirit men up. Because when the judgment comes, you may not know where to go and look for your faith to be strengthened. Conventions and meetings like this may not be held. Airways may be locked. No radio programs, no TV programs, internet censored. So you have been cut off from all the world. How are you going to stand then? Who is going to help you? Stop going up to the preacher and say, pray for my headache, pray for my stomach, pray for my this, pray for my that. Hey, okay, come on, let's grow up from being a baby Christian. Stop. Let's stop. You cannot continue to be babies all your life. When is it going to end? If you keep on coming up to the speaker and say, can you please pray? that my faith remains strong. You should pray for that. There are shortcuts in the Bible, you know, how to increase your faith. You want to know? So many shortcuts. But, they are long cuts. It's short, but it's long. The shortcut is this. Stir up your inner man by praying in the spirit, building up on your most holy faith. That is the shortcut, but it takes a long process to do. And we don't want to do that because we are lazy Christians. So we go through another unrighteous shortcut. We queue before the preacher. Please, let's stop all that. You cannot continue doing that. Go pass the outer court and into the holy place. You know, let me show you something, okay? In the outer court, you have two furniture. The altar of burnt sacrifice and the lever of washing. In the outer court, the people brought their sacrifices to the priests. Say, priests, please offer this on my behalf. So, 
everything they did was to the priest. They come to the priest. But in the holy place, there are three furniture. The table of showbread, the altar of incense, and the lampstand. In these three furniture, the priests offered themselves. There were no other middlemen. Where else in the outer court there is a middleman between you and the sacrifice. So when you continue to remain as a baby Christian, walking up to the pastor, walking up to the preacher, can you pray for my stomach pain? Can you pray for this pain? Pray for that pain? Pray for this? Pray for that? Then you are behaving like what they did in the Old Testament days, bringing your sacrifice to the priest, say, can you please offer this on my behalf? It's over. Now come into the holy place where you offer the incense on the altar. You bend your knees and you pray. You pray in the spirit. You meditate the word. You take the richness out of the word by yourselves. This is what we should do. Pass by. Dead works. Let's go on towards perfection. So, the judgment cannot be averted. So, what shall we do to survive during the judgment? Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 3 have the answer for us. Now, please turn with me to Zephaniah chapter 2 and the verse 3. It says here, Seek the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, who have kept his ordinances, seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be you shall be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. So what are we to do? Number one, seek the Lord. Start building up a relationship between you and your God. Build up. Start loving him. Come back to your first love. Spend time worshipping the Lord. Establish an altar in your house between you and the Lord. Secondly, seek righteousness. Do works of righteousness. Obeying the commandments of God. Obeying and doing it. Now, Noah was called a just man. A righteous man. Because he was righteous. Thirdly, seek meekness. What is that? Leaving the kingdom principles of God stated in Matthew chapter 5, 6 and 7. The teachings that the Lord Jesus Christ preached on the Beatitudes. And when you do all this dutifully, prayerfully, in the fear of God. Zechariah chapter 2 verse 5 says, And God will stretch out his hand and cover you with a wall of fire. You know, let me tell you something very interesting. What made the three Hebrew boys totally fireproof? One was inside them, they became solid, they fed brass. But, you see, the very hair on their skin were not even burned. So I pondered about that. Then when the Lord showed me the scripture, he said, this is what happened that day. You know, math tells us plus times minus equals what? You people never studied mathematics in school? <laughs> plus times minus is equal. Minus, okay? Plus into plus? Plus. So, you need fire to fight fire. Fire, when it meets fire, it kills. Right? You know that, right? So, the fiery furnace is all fire, and here comes the Lord who surrounds with a wall of fire. So, fire meets fire, the fire is killed. So, not a hair on their body was burned. So likewise will the Lord protect you 
from all evil, from whatever judgment that will come. Finally, now in the midst of all this, while everything seems to be going good for you, Satan will come to tempt you to give up your faith during this judgment period. Give up your faith. Why? Why are you fighting? Why are you holding? Look at all this mess that you're in. This is what happened to Peter. In Luke 22, verse 31, the Lord Jesus told Peter, the devil desired to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, Peter. I have prayed for you. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ is praying for us. That also means that, another thing, God has a secret special force of his saints, living and in glory, who will come to help us. Two kinds, you know, the makna him. The living saints, God's special forces. There are many of them in the world today, but they are hidden. They live hidden lives. Their ministry is not publicly known, for the Lord will not allow that. Their, their ministry is very hidden. They look ordinary guys, but they will suddenly appear to help, and then they suddenly disappear. And there are also saints in glory who will come to do those kind of work. Why God uses them instead of angels? You know, angels cannot sympathize with us. They have not gone through what we have gone through. So God sends humans, saints, who have gone through what you have gone through, and they'll say, don't worry. I've gone through this same path. This is how we will do it. You know, in the, in the month of April, I was called by the Lord to fast for seven days in Jerusalem. So during those days when I was there, I had several visits from the Saint Elijah. And he gave me teachings about Jezebel. And he said, the end time warrior army must not do the mistake like what I did. I ran away from Jezebel, but the last day's army must confront Jezebel, must confront Jezebel, and this is the secret. You must know the workings of Jezebel. Now, it takes a saint like Elijah, who has gone through that path, to come and teach us, okay, this is what you do. This is where I slipped, but you don't have to. But this is what you shall do, so that you can overcome and complete it, complete the cycle. We must pray. Pray. The Lord Jesus said, pray that your faith will remain strong during this temptation. In Luke 22, 40, the Lord Jesus Christ himself said that. You pray, you pray that you will be delivered from temptation. And in 2 Peter 2.9, the word of God says, God knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. My dear brothers and sisters, put your entire faith in the goodness of God and be prepared for the worst of times that's going to come upon us. If you are prepared then you are fireproofed. Amen? Amen. Thank you.